Hi everyone, this is the first of four videos on receivables, and in this video, I will be discussing accounts receivable. Receivables can be classified either as trade or non-trade. Trade receivables are those that arise from sale of merchandise or services in the ordinary course of business. On the other hand, non-trade receivables are those that arise from other sources. Trade receivables include accounts receivable and notes receivable. Accounts receivable are not supported by notes, whereas notes receivable are formal promises in the form of notes. Examples of non-trade receivables are as follows. Take note of the usual classification as to current or non-current. Trade and non-trade receivables are classified either as current or non-current. The classification criteria, however, are different for trade and non-trade receivables. For trade receivables to be considered current, they must be realizable within the normal operating cycle or one year, whichever is longer. On the other hand, for non-trade receivables to be considered current, they should be realizable within one year regardless of the operating cycle. Current trade receivables and current non-trade receivables are presented in the financial position as one line item, trade and other receivables. Non-current receivables are presented separately. Trade and other receivables are initially measured at face value and subsequently measured at net realizable value. PFRS 9 requires financial assets to be recognized initially at fair value plus transaction costs. In the case of trade and other receivables, which are classified as short-term or current, the fair value is simply the face value. Subsequently, trade and other receivables are measured at net realizable value, which is the initial amount net of all allowances. To arrive at the net realizable value, the following allowances are recognized. Freight charge, sales return, sales discount, and bad debts. An allowance for freight charge is recorded by the seller when goods are sold FOB destination but shipped freight collect. The owner of the goods shipped should be the one who pays for the freight. In FOB destination, the seller retains ownership of the goods in transit until arrival at the port of destination. Hence, the seller should pay for the freight. In FOB shipping point, the buyer becomes the owner of the goods from the point of shipment, and so the buyer should pay for the freight. However, the owner may not be the one who actually pays for the freight. The freight payment terms may be either freight collect or freight prepaid. Freight collect means the buyer pays for the freight, while freight Prepaid means the seller pays for the freight. In an FOB destination freight collect arrangement, the seller is supposed to pay for the freight, but it is the buyer who actually pays for the freight. Hence, an allowance for freight charge is recorded by the seller to bring down the related accounts receivable to net realizable value. An allowance for sales return is estimated at the end of the reporting period and reversed at the beginning of the subsequent period. Sales discounts can be either trade discounts or cash discounts. Trade discounts are granted for volume purchases and are not recorded in the books. On the other hand, cash discounts are granted to customers for prompt payment. Cash discounts are accounted using either gross method or net method. An allowance for sales discount is estimated at the end of the reporting period and reversed at the beginning of the subsequent period. Bad debts are accounted for using either direct write-off method or allowance method. Direct write-off recognizes bad debt loss when accounts prove to be worthless or uncollectible. On the other hand, allowance method records bad debt loss when accounts become doubtful. Under allowance method, the three methods for estimating doubtful accounts are aging, percentage of accounts receivable, and percentage of sales. The sales discount can be accounted for using either gross method or net method. Here is a sample illustration. Observe that when collection is made within the discount period, the net sales under both methods will be the same at 95,000 pesos. When collection is made beyond the discount period, sales under gross method will be 100,000 pesos, 
while sales under net method will be 95,000 pesos. Take note that the sales discount for fitted accounts is used under net method only. There are two methods of accounting for bad debts. These are direct write-off method and allowance method. As we can observe from the sample illustration, the direct write-off method records bad debt loss only when accounts proved worthless or uncollectible. The method is called direct write-off because the recognition of bad debt loss involves writing off the related accounts receivable. When the accounts are only doubtful of collection, no entry is necessary. On the other hand, the allowance method recognizes bad debt loss when accounts become doubtful of collection, resulting to an earlier recognition of bad debt loss than direct write-off method. It is referred to as allowance method because it involves setting up an allowance for doubtful accounts. In solving problems, it is important to know how transactions affect the balances of relevant accounts. Under the direct write-off method, we only have one balance sheet account, which is accounts receivable. Credit sale increases the accounts receivable balance. When accounts become doubtful, there is no entry, and so there is no effect. The entry to recognize bad debt expense and to write off worthless or uncollectible accounts results to a decrease in accounts receivable. Recovery of previously written off accounts increases the balance, and the collection of accounts decreases it. Under the allowance method, we need to take note how transactions affect the balances of accounts receivable with a normal debit balance and allowance for doubtful accounts with a normal credit balance. Credit sale increases accounts receivable. When accounts become doubtful, doubtful accounts expense is recognized and this increases the allowance for doubtful accounts balance. The write-off of worthless or uncollectible accounts decreases both accounts receivable and allowance for doubtful accounts. Recovery of previously written off accounts increases both accounts receivable and allowance for doubtful accounts. Finally, collection receivable decreases the accounts receivable balance. The allowance method entails estimating doubtful accounts for which we have three methods. First is aging of accounts receivable, which focuses on the statement of financial position or the valuation of accounts receivable. Second is percentage of accounts receivable, which also focuses on the statement of financial position or the valuation of accounts receivable. And third is percentage of sales, which focuses on the income statement and conforms with the matching principle. The aging of accounts receivable computation gives us the required balance of the allowance for doubtful accounts. The difference between the required balance and the unadjusted balance is the doubtful accounts expense. The allowance for doubtful accounts normally has a credit balance, but it can also have a debit balance. An unadjusted debit balance is added to the required balance to compute for doubtful accounts expense. Similar to aging, the percentage of accounts receivable method computes first for the required balance of the allowance for doubtful accounts and then the doubtful accounts expense. The percentage of sales method differs from the other two methods since it computes first for the doubtful accounts expense, which is then added to the unadjusted balance of the allowance for doubtful accounts to arrive at the allowance for doubtful accounts. The rate to be used is based on historical performance and applied to the credit sales during the period. And those are all for accounts receivable. Please feel free to leave your questions and comments in the comment section of my Facebook post. The next video will be on notes receivable. See you!